I am going to uh, today try to uh, introduce you to the topic of multimodal communication. And uh, we have a long list of things we're going to try to uh, discuss. Perhaps we will not have time to discuss all of them, but we'll try our best. So, here's the first question we're going to discuss today. And as usual, I'd like you to think a little about uh, what we do, and then I tell you what I, the answers I have to this question. So you can discuss with your neighbors, and if you sit alone like you do, you turn around and you discuss with them. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I'll give you a few minutes to discuss this question. Why should we study multimodal communication? Uh, here are some of your answers. Who wants to start? I know we have a brave young man over here. <laughs> so um, we actually came up with uh, something very interesting, an experience that we saw someone communicate through sign language using a phone uh, video camera. So we're saying that the reason why study much more communication is to allow for a better um, engulfing of the multimodality of communication. So this Okay, so he's giving us an example about blind person, um, a, deaf person. a deaf person, and uh, of course uh, one of the sensory modalities, hearing, has been blocked. And so, uh, if you study multimodal communication, you might think of uh, other ways of using other modalities to compensate for the loss of hearing. And if you understand more about this, then you can get better help in this case. Okay, any other reasons? This, this was like a, what should I call it? This was a compassion kind of reason. You know? yeah. Having compassion with those who cannot use all of their modalities. Yeah? Yeah? Uh, it's because uh, our lives uh, are surrounded uh, around multimodal communication and you, vice versa. You are surrounded by multimodal communication. Yeah. I agree with you. So uh, whatever we do, right now, yeah. not whatever we do for us, but when we communicate with other people, it's uh, normally multimodal. And you're saying you want to understand that more deeply. Mm, not understand. You don't want to understand. Uh, what I want is just to pass the exam. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a good reason at all. That makes me upset to hear something like that. You should be here to try to understand and learn, not just to pass exams. Then you might as well not be here. I wasn't uh, completely serious with my question. No, with don't my say such things. It makes me feel shaky. No, that's the least thing that I want. Oh, good, yeah. good. So you also have compassion, like him, for me. Yeah. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> okay. But, but so I, but I agree with you basically. It's holistic view of communication must be multimodal. Because that's what, you know, we see, we hear, we smell, we taste, etc. Et yeah. Anything else? Okay. I have a longer list, which I will now show you, but at least you gave this some thought. So the first one is sort of close to your reason. It's interesting in itself. Because that's what human communication is all about. What we are built for and are used to. So that, that's... Uh, if you study uh, some communication in some other way, you're studying it in, in actually in some more limited way. But when we start to look at this, we notice that a lot of what's going on is still unknown. Or there are subconscious types of influence between people when they talk to each other? Probably there are. When I talk to another free person, does it influence my heartbeat? Maybe it does. But there are a lot of things that we don't really know. And so there's still a lot of white spots on this map which we can try to uh, find out more about. And one of the... Uh, means to do that is to create, to record people and then create 
collections of data, and when, often when we gather communication data, we call it the corpus. And you've heard this word before, I think. So uh, a linguistic corpus is, is a collection of linguistic data. Very often it has in the, in the past been transcribed, but uh, right now we're also collecting corpora of just reporting of various, various types. Corpus is a Latin word which means body, and this of course is a metaphorical word, um, use of the word body, a body of collect, a collection of, of data. Okay, and we, when we have that kind of, and, and one of the things we've been doing here in Gothenburg in our department is to collect or try to build a multimodal corpus. Has any of you been in, visited our internet site and seen this? We have a, it's called the Nonco Corpus. You can all, uh, if you like, you can try to see, find it on internet later. And, and if you do that, you will go there and you will find that there are, we are trying to do some crowdsourcing. We're going to ask you some questions about what you're seeing. So you can go there and try that out yourself. Okay, and so if you have that kind of data collections, then you have a good background. Uh, for studying multimodal communication, but also for perhaps simulating it and putting it in various ways into technical systems. We'll come back to that. Okay, so we'll come back to that right here. Source for design of computer-supported applications. So I'm sure you all are aware that lots of people are now interested in designing robots to move around physically and speak and gesture and they are sometimes humanoid robots or people are designing um, virtual agents that is uh, just programs that appear on the internet with a front that has a body and a face etc have you has anybody not ever seen this no everybody I hope that's true, that you're not, not just not putting up your hand because you're shy, but because you have actually seen this. <laughs> so you're all aware that it's, it's, uh, it's uh, coming, there are more and more of this. And if we know what we're doing when we construct those figures, we can have more redundance, more uh, robustness, synergy in what we're doing. We can have more natural and efficient, HMI means human-machine interaction, human-computer interaction. And, of course, also understand and perhaps use that understanding to make our own communication with other human beings more enjoyable and efficient. Yeah? What do you think about manipulating uh, reasons to study multimodal communication, like in order to convince someone or in order to know how to combine specific multimodal um, users in order to convince someone in business how to use, for example, smell in a shop or how to behave as a politician, how to dress, how to... I, I think those reasons have, behind, have been behind the interest in multimodal communication for thousands of years. <laughs> and you can find them when you study rhetoric, for example. Uh, how, sh how should a, a speaker convince his auditorium? Well, by doing the right gestures, having the right tone of voice, uh, you can think about the marriage market or uh, getting a partner, you know, how should you behave to attract whatever kind of partner you want. Uh, you can, uh, your examples you gave, what was it, sales? Yeah. Yeah, sales. Yeah, that, that interest in manipulation of other people is, is, has always been there. I think it's uh, difficult to, uh, to stop it. <laughs> it certainly is one of the interests, pushing interest in multimodal communication. Well, of course, uh, we can all have an ethical dislike of too much if, it, if the manipulation is false. If we're trying to ingratiate with other people or give them an impression that we like them when we don't really like them, etc., that, that's, uh, well, of course, ethically questionable. But it's still, I don't think there's much we can do about it. People are still going to have that interest. You know? So, I, uh, yeah, I think it's fine. It's, it's an interest. If it makes you be more interested in multimodal communication, keep your interest. <laughs> okay. Uh, 
So actually, the first two the, oh, things there are close to what you're asking about. Better, better skills in negotiation. Um, how can we, if you want to help people when they are in conflict, to try to solve their conflict? Uh, you sometimes have to have negotiation between them, and how, how can this negotiation be made more skillful? Well, for example, if you understand the body language of other people, you can see what they're really feeling and what should be done at that point. In the same way, if you're a counselor of some sort, and there are many counselors, there are doctors, there are lawyers, there are bankers, etc., etc., priests, all of these people actually sit down usually and talk to other people. And uh, they understand them better, they can have more empathy, they can understand them in various ways, interpret what they're doing, if they have an understanding of multimodal communication. So I, I hope you can all see that this, this is a central part of of the study of communication, human communication. Uh, back to machines, we can make new interactive search machines, both on the internet and local databases. We can make various kinds of virtual reality applications. One of the places where a lot of money is being spent right now, and perhaps they are sometimes in the forefront of understanding how to simulate human multimodal communication is in the games industry. So there are lots of people actually now working on more and more human-like games using computer programs. And there are even, you know, ter terms like serious games, etc., etc. So this whole, and lots of universities are offering special education in how to make games. Among such universities we find this university. Are you aware of this? That one of your neighboring departments here, you are aware, you're nodding. Yeah. What, what do you know about this? I have my boyfriend, he is playing a lot of games. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> is he also studying here? No, he's not, but his friend is doing that. His friend is doing yeah. that, yeah. Yeah, so they, they uh, sort of, the, um, uh, Division, our twin division, so to speak, of interaction design, they have a, a special research group on games. And they're interested in well, how to make games, and the effects of games, etc. Another uh, place is, of course, uh, distance education, where you can have artificial teachers as part of the parcel, sometimes. It's sometimes called tutoring system. Sometimes in trade, you can have auctioning. Who has been on eBay? Never heard of eBay? You have. Two or three people. You know, in such systems <laughs> where they have a, a electronic auctioning or yeah, where they have a, sometimes you have a mediator who is a actually a program with a with a human front. Okay. Public information system, commercial systems. So one of the challenges that you will be equipped to actually uh, address to some extent is the combination of multimodality with multiculturality and multifunctionality. What is meant by multifunctionality here? Well, sometimes they make a system that can, uh, what shall I say, advise you on banking. But if you ask it about the weather, it won't have anything to say. Because it doesn't have any words, it has no understanding of the weather. But human beings, have this ability to switch from one topic to another, from one function to another. Computer systems so far don't really have that ability. It's one of the big challenges. So if we can combine multifunctionality, multiculturality, and multimodality, that's what's coming. But we're not there yet. So there's a lot of work to, to do yet. Okay. So now we have some motivation for why we should study this. But, of course, the question remains, what is it that we're studying? So, what is multimodal communication? Now you have again a few minutes to think about what it is. Right? Let's hear what you, which aspects of multimodal communication you have discovered, or maybe you have a complete definition here. Who wants to start? How about the courageous fellow at the very opposite end? You? Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
uh, multi-modal communication, I guess it is combination of gesture, gestures, postures, and uh, non-verbal communication, verbal communication, and everything that goes, that kind of we need to make the communication effective or to pass our ideas through. I, we, we were discussing about the special word, like interaction, what is interaction? For multi-model communication, we, we reach to the word interaction. But if we do need, if, if we need uh, interaction for communication, if you look at TV, yeah, and you are watching somebody reading the news or anything, is that communication? No. No. Yes. Most people would say yes. I would say yes. <laughs> but is it interaction? Very minimal. It's uh, you're getting the TV signal and it's activating some understanding in you. So in that sense, there is a response in you, namely your understanding. How about uh, a robot? What? How, how about a robot? We we just saw a film of a robot that Michael showed us. Yeah. And uh, it was pre-programmed, and uh, it or he he was reiterating some pre-programmed things yes. to, to the viewers, but uh, it was a it wasn't mutual communication, I guess. You are not prepared to calling calling interaction with a robot that gives you some kind of a communicative signals communication. Yeah. Because the robot does not have a soul. No, because he can't. Uh, 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 what do we say? He, he doesn't have the creativity. Well, is, isn't it in the end a soul? Okay. Maybe so. Yeah, so a lot of people uh, find that uh, that's uh, an essential part of communication, that you have another being who has a spirit or a mind or whatever you want to call it, and the robot doesn't, so then they feel uh, maybe it's not communication. But there is a challenge for people who feel this way. When I communicate with other people, could there be some things that are being communicated that are subconscious? Yes. Yes. How's that different from communicating with a robot? Yeah, we were, we were actually talking about that because I was saying that, uh, he said that, but we cannot shake hands, we, can ha we cannot have an, that kind of interaction with a robot. And I said that we actually we can if he's programmed to do that. Yes. <coughs> and a human being is also programmed to do that, actually. We don't have it from birth. By God or what? No, we don't have it from birth. We are just programmed by other people or society that we, we are going to shake hands. Are we using the word program in a very metaphorical sense now? <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> you're, you're calling programming the same as other people would call learning or education. Yes, exactly. Or <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. But just to find some similarities with the robot and us. Yeah, but uh, you know, we human beings are also born with some genes. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to hint ah. at. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but you had, you had, you said a lot of things, and uh, well, one of the problems that you brought up is this thing, how much interaction we should require in communication, and for my part, I think that we should at least require, uh, require this understanding part, which we do have in watching a TV show. Another problem you brought up is this uh, problem of uh, how much of a mind should we require of the parties that are communicating. And in the case of the robots and, and the computer programs, virtual agents, it's questionable if they have the mind. So some people are on that basis not willing to call it communication. You seem to be one of those, so you're, you call it interaction instead. Okay. 
Uh, but other people say, well, since we are prepared to count subconscious influence as, as communication, it's harder to make draw the line to robots. So, you know, to some extent, you have to make up your mind yourself here and say, okay, I mean by communication also subconscious things. That makes it hard for me not to talk about robot communication. Or else you have to think of some way to separate human subconscious communication from communicating with a robot. Maybe you can, but it's not so easy. Okay, so you, you uh, I think you had a lot, lot of interesting thoughts around this, uh, but then mainly your definition of multimodal communication actually consisted in a, uh, enumeration of examples, which is not really a definition. So anybody else wants to try? But the examples were quite okay. I mean, you, you had uh, gesture, posture, etc. Let's see at least one more try. How about you two ladies? You too, yes. yes. <laughs> I can't hear you. You have what about you? You don't have a cold, do you? You don't what? I don't have <laughs> oh, but they have a, what, what is multimodal communication? Multimodal communication from the human to human communication or human machine communication using multi-sensory devices. Do you hear her? No. Okay. If you have production modality, you must also have reception or perception, right? So she says multisensory interaction, communication uh, between humans or machines. Here's a more liberal person than you. <laughs> <laughs> you want to switch the word uh, sensory, you want to use the word uh, channel instead? Yeah, some people do. That leads to problems, as we will see. Okay, so now I, I think you've all had some time to think about what it is, and I think you're all more or less on the same track as I'm going to be. So first we start by talking about communication, so here we have this definition, co-activation, sharing and co-construction of information. I think last year I told you why I prefer words like co-activation to words like transfer, uh, because transfer doesn't make the receiving sign, the recipient, active enough. If you have co-activation, you can see that both the producer and the receiver of information are active. And what's going on is that both parties are being activated by communication. Minimally, understanding is activated like in watching a TV show. But if you have a face-to-face -face communication, usually that understanding is followed by some other reactions, which is followed by a response to the other person. So that becomes much more interactive. Okay. So sharing is another word which has sort of the same implications. We talked about, I think, last year this also. And co-construction means that very often when you're talking to another person, you construct the content together. It's not just the product of one person, but both people are adding to the content that's being produced in, in the conversation. Okay, now let's go to modality and multimodality. Modality is a Latin word, Come, or it comes from a Latin word, modus, which means manner or way. So modal is just an adjective for modus, and multimodal means many, many manners. Okay, so basically it could be many kinds of manners. In fact, the word multimodal is also used in many different ways. 
Of course, it's a very abstract and general word. Here, in multimodal communication, the point of departure is this. Modalities of perception and production, like you said. Okay? Sensory modal actually, sensory modality, perception is more basic than production. You said it the other way around. But actually it's seeing, hearing, etc. It's the basic. Talking and so on is secondary. So the, the point of departure is sensory modality. And the idea is that communication involves all the sensory modalities. And how many are there? Who said five? Somebody? Are you sure there are no more? Huh? There are six? What is the sixth one? Six cents? What? The heart. Well, that, that sounds very poetic. <laughs> Maybe so. Okay. But actually, a sense of temperature is supposed to be another one. And uh, some people even count balance and so on. So I, actually, the number of senses, it's just the external senses are five. There are more senses. Sense of pressure, etc. There are, there are other senses also, which are more subtle. But anyway, these five... Vision, hearing, touch, smell, taste. The Latin words here, gustatory, olfactory, this is taste and this is smell. Or they are what's normally meant by when you talk about multiple communication. And you use all of these means then. Of course, when we study this, we're mostly only going to use two of these. Namely, uh, uh, hear, hearing and seeing. <clears throat> okay, now, when we go into this field, we will see that there are two main theoretical traditions in multimodal communication. There is the European tradition, which uh, we are mainly going to follow here. Uh, which means that you see as basic to the study of multimodal communication, you see human face-to-face -face communication. Two human beings who are talking to each other. And on the basis of this, you can build, for example, artificial agents or robots, etc., like that. That, that. In this tradition, the definition I just gave you of modalities of perception and production being the basic thing is what we mean by multimodal communication. Okay. However, there is another tradition which has its stronghold in Australia. Anybody from Australia here? No, anyway, it comes from an English linguist called Michael Halliday who emigrated to Australia and started something called Systemic Functional Grammar. He got a lot of students and some of them were Dutch and German. And so here we have a guy called Theo van Leuven and another one called Gunther Kress, who decided that Halliday's functional systemic grammar could also be used to study pictures and text together in books. Okay, so in this tradition, we have a kind of linguistic point of departure in Halliday's work, and we land in actually having as our basis what we're studying basically is the relationship between picture and text. And you might say, well, you know, at least we have, actually both are, from this point of view, both are vision, both are seeing. There's no hearing here. And the other sensory modalities don't necessarily have to be part of this. But since the word modus or mode is a very abstract word, of course it can also be used in this way. So it could be used, you know, multimodal could, use, could mean 
picture and text. And that's what it means for these people. Okay? But up here, they, this school is not multimodal because they are just looking at vision, text and picture. Okay, so you can see that this actually leads to misunderstanding sometimes. And, 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 and these two schools are very active, both of them right now. So when you see conferences announced on the internet, you should look more carefully to see which kind of multimodality is being studied. And let me also say that this school, the Australian school, has been most successful with people who are interested in education, school teachers, pedagogues, educationalists, because they, well, they're interested in producing learning materials for children in schools. And you can also see that this school has been very successful in the countries which are closer to Australia. What countries are those? Well, for example, China, Malaysia, etc. So, in the, in the sphere around Australia, you can see a lot more of this. This school is much more popular in Europe, except with educationalists, where this school is the popular school. Okay, so sometimes this happens in science that, uh, and that terms get used in different ways by different people. And that is the case right now with this term multimodality. Anybody, has anybody noticed this already or, no? Well, when, now you're, you're getting more sensitive to the term multimodal. So if you see advertisements for conferences and so on, look more closely. If a lot of talks are about the relationship between picture and text, then you know you're here. If, there, if it's about human interaction, face to face, then you're up here. Yeah. Well, I think in the future probably we'll see these two schools coming together more. That's already happening, but sometimes what happens, you go to... I, for example, went to Australia believing that I was going to this kind of conference, and I ended up in this kind of conference. <laughs> And I was one of the few people talking about human-to-human -human interaction. All the others were talking about diagrams and pictures. And, you know. So there was a slight misunderstanding. And then I understood, you know, the world is actually, we have different schools here. Yeah. Okay, there are still other alternatives to what the word multimodal could mean. And sometimes it does mean that, since the word is quite abstract, it can be used in any way. So one meaning it could have is what I'm calling medium here. That is the physical carrier of these signals that we are interested in. Light waves for gestures or pictures. Sound waves for, for speaking. Molecules for taste and smell. Uh, magnet, electromagnetic waves. These all are media carrying the sensory modality information. It could also possibly for some people mean this. What I'm here now calling type of representation. Which I think we talked a lot about last term. So uh, the difference between index, icon and symbol. Which comes from uh, Charles Sanders Peirce's work. Some people call this multimodal, but you should have had enough lectures and seminars now not to call, for example, this multimodal. Should not call it multimodal. And then even some of the people, and now we come closer to the Australian school, call what I'm here calling communication aids. That is writing, radio, TV, multimodal. So if you have a, you know, if you're studying something uh, in, in, on radio or studying it on TV, then it's multimodal. Well, it can be also in, in the sense I'm uh, advocating here. I mean, if it involves both eyes and ears, then it is multimodal also in this sensory modality sense. But if it doesn't, then it's not multimodal in that sense. Okay, so now you know that uh, we, you have to be a little careful when you look at this word. It can be used in, in several different ways. And I end up by giving a suggestion for a definition that this is in the tradition of the European, uh, yeah, this European tradition. I should also say that the European 
uh, tradition is slightly older than the Australian. So I brought up here, it's the European way of talking about multimodal communication actually started in the 1980s. And the first books entitled Multimodal Communication came out around that time. Whereas these, this Australian tradition starts much more recently, late 90s, early 2000s, is when these books are coming out. So they're about 20 years after. The Australian tradition is about 20 years later than the European. So the definition we have here, I just added some of what we've said to the definition I gave on the first page here. Multimodal communication, co-activation, sharing and co-construction of information simultaneously and sequentially through several modes of perception and production. So it shouldn't, I mean, first part is the same definition of communication as we had before, and I've just now specified fact that it should be multimodal through several modes of perception and production. Yeah? Uh, so this means uh, multimodal communication can only happen between two or more. It can never... Uh, Why? Where do you get two here? Co-construction... No, co could be three. Co doesn't mean two. No, uh, what I mean is it has to be with many parties. Like well, it has to be more than one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so at, at least two. So one one person cannot just uh, carry a multimodal uh, communication with one production. Well, you can you can print. You can alone record a message for another person, which is multimodal. But then there is another person who is uh, the intended receiver. So it's implicit. Potentially, it's two, right? Yeah. <coughs> but if you. Uh, if you communicate with yourself, <laughs> like you, you go and walk around your house and you talk to yourself, yeah. maybe you do, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think it's a slightly, it's an extended sense of what we normally <laughs> have in mind. I'm not going to say it would be excluded, but it's a very special sense. Communicating, I mean we say communicating with yourself, so the word communication is used there. But it means that somehow you you have to produce messages which you yourself somehow hear and interpret, right? I, I think if you're just quiet and you're walking around your house and thinking, we wouldn't normally call that communication. That, that's just, uh, well, you're reflecting, you're thinking. But if you walk around and say, now I want a glass of water. And I'm going to open the tap here and get my glass and now I'm drinking. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> we call that communication, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> um, okay, so given these other words that I have introduced, medium, representation, communication aids, we can see that multimodal communication in the sense of involving several sensory modalities always becomes multimedial because you have to have the medium there carrying the information about gestures, about voice, etc. It very often becomes multi-representational. So if, for example, if I'm saying, I'm very small and I do this with my hand, then I'm, that's iconic. And they are making a picture of smallness. And even my voice, in a sense, is trying to give you a picture of smallness. But then I have my words, which are symbols. So that message would be multi-representational. It would use icons and symbols. And very often we also use several aids of communication. Like now when I'm lecturing, I'm using this PowerPoint, and I'm talking at the same time. So, multimodal communication often has these other senses of multi as well. Representation, medium, and age of communication. Okay, this I think we've already talked a little about. You know, this from last year, index icon symbol. And uh, I think I've already said this, that 
very often multimodal communication uses words, gestures at the same time. And we've also said, I think, that very often bodily communication is not only intentional and aware, but also perhaps has a dimension which is unaware, unintentional, and that is quite often non-verbal. It, it, very often it has to do with emotions, attitudes, but maybe also other things which are outside of our awareness. Okay, um, the two basic things in communication is always production and perception understanding. And Multimodality becomes, comes in both of these. So it's relevant both for production and planning of different expressions, and it's relevant for perception, understanding of different expressions. Okay, I think this is a good time to make a little break. What are we most aware of? Our voice or our gestures? Yes. That's or a good question. Or or yeah. yeah, that's a good question. What do you think yourself? I think we are more aware in a, in a new situation. The, the more used we are to something, then we are less aware of it. But that's the, now you're asking a different question than the question I asked you. What are we most aware of, our voice or our gestures? Oh, okay. Uh, our voice. <laughs> our voice. I would say, yeah. Is that true for everyone in this room? You're more aware of what you're saying, speaking, than what you do with your gestures? Yes. yes. Nobody here is more aware of their gestures. Maybe if we had somebody who had, uh, was deaf, who had deaf sign language, they would feel different. <laughs> I think, well, we don't know. Maybe, or else it's uh, given innately by our genes that we're all more aware of our voices. I am more aware of, of my voice than I am of my gestures, definitely. I do a lot of gesturing that I am not thinking about. Yeah, that's a good question. Awareness, how is it tied to production modalities? Any other questions? Yeah, you have one? Yeah. yeah. Is it possible to translate between modalities? Is it possible to translate between modalities? That means translating between seeing and hearing. What does that mean, actually? So if you see a strong light, what would that be if you translate it to hearing? sound. How about that? A strong light becomes a strong sound. Yeah, maybe in that sense one could think of translating about between modalities. But one sense that people sometimes mean when they say translation between modalities, we should not call translation between modalities. They, they think of things like translating between pictures and textual description. That's not between modalities. It is between modalities, but the central thing is, well, if you're right, it's vision, both of them. But let's say you were describing a picture speaking, then you would have two different modalities. But the main problem is not the modality change, I think, there, but it's the type of representation. You're crossing from a picture, iconic representation, to words which is symbolic. And actually, that is the problem there. It's not translation between modalities. And that, of course, is a problem which is interesting. Okay? Anything else? Yeah? Something, uh, for example, uh, in regarding learning, um, learning context, for example, which modalities, but so do they learn more by seeing or do they learn more by hearing 
Because they learn more by touching. Yeah? How did, uh, did you think of any particular, what, what, what would you do, an experiment? How would you study this? I guess it's mostly in school context. You would, just, <laughs> you would just observe them? No, no, there should be some experiments, of course. Uh, different, uh, trying different way of learning. Yeah, so you would have some specific task that they have to yeah, learn? Yeah, they have to do, and uh, to give some information through different ways. Uh, slides, audio, um, or maybe within um, in a situation of game or interaction, and yeah. see after. And then you would compare the effects of learning through pictures and learning through words, perhaps. Yeah. That would bring you closer to the Australian school. But it would still be okay here because you would be using, if you had, you were reading the text, you would be still be using multimodality in our but sense. But it's not also. about only reading the text, it's also about hearing and touching. As if yeah, okay, hearing. so you would involve other yeah. senses. Huh? But, but I think basically that's what the study needs, a comparison between yeah. different ways of doing it and then looking at the effects of the it's ways. It's also here you need to take into account the age, yeah. how old it is. Yes. Yeah. Good. Anything else? Yeah? Yeah, but that is as well very popular now at schools, uh, uh, learning by situation. Like they are taking children, for example, to forest. And then they are counting trees. By the counting trees, they learn math, one, two, three, three trees. Then they are watching what is color of these trees. This is brown and green. And then they are listening to, to the uh, birds, to the birds. <laughs> and then this is part of music. So this is very interesting. This is multimodality, I think, as well. And then children, they are memorizing the situation after they come back to classroom and they are analyzing what they see, what they hear, and how they feel about it. And then it's uh, staying more deep in their memory. Yeah, one of the things we usually say about memory is that it is contextual. Mm -hmm. That you, for example, there's this uh, famous experiment by uh, the English um, psychologist Alan Badley, where he took divers under, let's say, 100 meters you know, below the sea level, and he asked them to learn meaningless syllables, ba, da, so on. And then he took them up again, and he asked them to repeat the syllables, and they couldn't do it, but he took them down again, and then they could do it. <laughs> okay, so that's a very strange way of demonstrating that the situation, the context in which you learn is important for what you learn, okay? So there's always a kind of contextual effect. You learn in a situation, if you're brought back to that situation, your memory comes back to you. It's exactly, this is the same like you preparing to exam. If you see it for some time and you're memorizing, and then after a couple of months, you are not sure if you memorize, you, if you remember still of the things that you knew for some time ago. But if you see it in your sofa and you think like, oh darling, studying to this exam, I was doing this, 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 the things are coming more fast to, and easier for you because they're connected with the situation. Yeah. But is this a problem or a help when we discuss multimodality? So it's clear that we, we are learning things in multimodal situations and if we are brought back to that multimodal situation, we might remember what we learned. But what if we are not brought back? Because part of what you want, if you're teaching children mathematics, you don't want to end up with the result that they're very good with counting trees, but they can count nothing else. <laughs> you would like them no, to make a transfer from trees to cars or something. No, it's not exactly about counting the trees, this is the way of memorizing. Yeah, but if memory is contextual, uh, unfortunately, one effect might be that you know they will remember how to count if you get them back to the trees. But if you point at the cars, it's not the same context. <laughs> So we need to do something more when we have learning. We have to vary context, I think. Yeah. So it's not enough in one context, is what I'm saying. You need to do maybe the same exercise going somewhere else. 
And it's very interesting like, to look at actually kids with some disabilities or learning difficulties and how they perceive. Yeah. And like here uh, talking about special teaching, special teacher. Uh, because they definitely have another way of perception and understand, understanding. Yeah, yeah, they do. Yeah. But I still think it's true that you're learning context, but if you want your learning to be a little more abstract than the context you learn it in, you have to maybe vary the context and learn the same thing once more. And then you get several contexts, and then you are able to form some sort of abstraction, which is what, what you need for many kinds of learning. You know, someone, you put up your hand. Yeah, yeah no, I was just going to add that, of course, it is also used to get them more interested. And therefore, they will learn better. Yeah. yeah. No, that's of course. Yeah, yeah. Multi yeah. modality. So of course, the context, but of course, yeah. you know, getting them into the nature, it yes. will get them more intrigued yes. to learn. Yes. You know. So motivation, emotional, yeah, motivation positive perspective. feelings. Yes. Yeah. I agree. That's very often connected with multi modality. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Uh, I have two uh, concerns about multi uh, communication. First one is uh, about the scale of it. Database. The scale of the multimodal communication. The scale. Yes. Okay. Can multi? Can we use multimodal communication mm -hmm. to to answer for uh, larger questions like uh, issues like culture and society? And the second one is. The comparison with the conversation analysis. With the what? Conversation analysis. Yeah. Uh, I wonder why multimodal communication does not include uh, intonational <coughs> patterns. It does. It's it's much more uh, into gaze and. No no no. International patterns are a very strong part of multimodal communication. And that's not correct. I mean, that all, all mod modalities of expression are part of, of studying multimodal communication. If, if we are doing multimodal communication and we include all the senses, isn't this the issue that if we just uh, focus on two or three uh, modes, the others left outside and the... That's because it's difficult to study smell, taste, and so on. Not the principle. I mean, we would like to be able to study. Touch is sometimes studied because it's easy. The two easiest are, are seeing and hearing. And then touch, and then smell and taste are more difficult. It has been studied sometimes, but it's, it's a lot more difficult. For example, for blind people, they have been made, well, that's touch again, haptic uh, ways of communicating. But smile and touch are the most difficult. There are, if you look at the body of literature on the different modalities, you will get least for smell and touch. But there are, there are. People have studied that too, you know, the effects of different smells of sweat, etc. It, it, it exists, certainly, but it's more rare. No, but intonation, or intonation, and prosody, or they're not excluded. They're part of it. But to, to your first question, um, multimodality in relation to uh, broader studies of culture, etc. Well, first of all, the way we multimodally communicate is slightly different in slightly in different human cultures. So, when we talk about differences in gesturing differences in how close people stand to each other, etc. All these differences, they are often cultural differences and they involve multimodal communication. If we take multimodal in the broader sense of, let's say, going more towards the Australian uh, line, where you look at picture and, and text, etc. Uh, of course, we have different, art, different types of art, different types of theater, all of this is multimodal, and it varies from culture to culture. So I don't, it's not very hard to associate uh, studies of multimodal communication with studies of multiculturality. I would no, that I think is fine. In fact, that would be one of the research questions: is how does multimodal communication vary with culture?
Yeah. Okay. Is that multimodal? Yeah. See, she did. <laughs> what did you mean by that? I have to sign the attendance. <laughs> okay. Good. Now I'll show you what topics I thought of. So, first I have two very basic questions. That is the uh, question of distribution or fission and integration or fusion. Okay, so when I am speaking, look at me now, when I'm, why am I doing this? Why are my hands going up when I'm speaking? <laughs> Whatever. It means that part of the content of what I'm saying is coming out in the words I'm using. And part of the content is coming out through my gestures. That, that's an example of this. A content is distributed on different production modalities. With a metaphorical term taken from physics, when people study this, for some reason it, it was engineers who started this kind of study, and they use this word fission. It's what the term that is used when you split an atom. In the same way, when you are talking to another person or listening to me now, you're also seeing me gesturing. So in your mind, somehow the content of what I'm saying is a product of both the words I'm using and the gestures I'm using. So that's the opposite. That's integrating uh, information from several sensory modalities. So these two are actually, I would say, the two basic theoretical problems of multimodal communication. How does that actually happen? And that very quickly leads us to uh, brain studies. How are different parts of the brain activated when I'm talking? How are motor commands to my vocal cords, to my arm muscles, are they coordinated with each other? Or are they acting separately? What's happening in the brain? Same way when you're listening, how are different parts of the brain sending information to each other? When I'm doing this with my hands, are you somehow, maybe with a low degree of awareness, you're noticing this hand movement that's somehow integrated with the words I'm using? Okay, in, in these two areas, we are seeing quite a lot of new theories coming up here. And they, they are very basic to the whole area of multimodal communication. Okay. Um, a slightly less basic question, but still quite basic, is what modes of production and perception are used for what, you might say, in human-human communication. So that means, what kinds of information do I use my hands to convey? What kinds of information do I use my intonation, prosody, to convey? What kinds of information do I use the uh, verbal meaning of the verbal symbols? So that's modes of production. And what kind of information am I taking in through my ears, through my eyes? Uh, if, if somebody touches me. So, a study of, of the different means of production and perception is another kind of basic descriptive task of multimodal communication. So, I told you when, we start, when I started uh, when we, uh, today that maybe when we talk to each other, our heartbeat is affected. Or, uh, what shall I say, skin conductance, sweat could be affected by what other people are saying. So that would be studying types of perception or reaction to perception that we don't know so much about. But people are now starting to study such things more than they did earlier. So we are hoping to acquire some new types of sensors where we could, for example, study heartbeat in relation to what other people are saying. Okay, so that, these are all sort of basic descriptive types of questions. 
And here's another one that is fairly basic. Are some forms of representation modality neutral and others modality specific? So, compare spoken and written language to pictures. Pictures are iconic. Spoken and written language are largely symbolic. Do symbols and icons have a different relation to sensory mo modes, sensory modalities? The answer is yes. You cannot have a picture really without choosing sensory modality. You must choose vision. Right? Pictures are, well, of course, you could have an auditory picture, but let's say I was mimicking a dog. <laughs> uh, but I'm, then I, I am in the auditory modality. I'm not free of modality. I have the auditory modality. If I'm making a drawing, I have the visual modality. So, Iconic representation is automatically tied to a certain sensory modality. Probably it's largely the same story when we come to index, indices. But is it the same story when we come to symbols? No. If we take the word horse, a horse can make us think of a galloping horse on a field, but it could also make us think of whatever the sound that a horse makes. I cannot make the sound. <laughs> but for, for some of you who are uh, experienced with horses, you know, you can think of that. It's called neighing in English. Okay. Uh, it could also make you think of the, uh, for some people, pleasant smell of a horse. For other people, horrible smell of a horse. <laughs> whatever it is, right? So, the word horse in itself is not really tied to any specific modality. It can occur in written form, vision. It can occur in auditive form, hearing. Okay? So, the word itself is much more, the symbol here is more abstract and can, in fact, activate several modalities. Maybe all sensory modalities. So that's actually a radical difference between the symbolic mode of representation and the iconic and indexical. Symbols are, in a sense, humankind's way of freeing ourselves from modality. With, with symbols, we were able to think a little more abstractly. We can activate several, I'm not saying, I mean, what's happening here? Are we totally free, or is it just that we are activating multimodally ra rather than just one modality? So there's a question here, do symbols, they are multimodal because the horse could activate all the modalities. But it's not modality free. The question is, can we by use of symbols also become modality free? Can we reach another level of abstraction? Well, some people claim yes. And what are the examples to support that? Well, it's mathematics. So are we going to say that words like one, two, three, plus, are they connected with some specific modality? Or are they more abstract? Some people say they are more abstract, some people try to defend the line that they are still sensory. I um, have never, I think myself that they probably are more abstract. And that, that step in human evolution, in human thinking, actually was, we've been able to take through the use of symbols. That means that human thinking has made good use of this, of this form of representation, symbols. Okay, so these are all fairly, as you can hear, basic theoretical questions which have to do with multimodal communication. Yeah? I have a question. Your number an example, but that's not always every object kind of, like if it's neutral or not neutral, depend on the subjective feeling of the receiver? 
Like for someone, numbers could be totally neutral. But yeah. for someone, like seeing just some kind of mathematical formula already is super stressed because he has super bad experience and whenever he sees a number, he's totally freaking out. On the other hand, someone could have some autistic moves yeah. and he sees a, some kind of animal and it doesn't touch him at all because he says like a horse, totally neutral. Who needs horses? I don't. So it's super subjective, kind of. You're, you're saying that uh, some people have individual associations to numbers which carry them to specific modalities? Yes. Yeah, I agree. But in general, I mean, it's also possible to use numbers without those associations. Yeah, but it's also possible for like some horse girls to freak out when they see a horse and from movies to not freak out. Yeah, yeah, sure. No, no, of course, there are lots of... It's not specific connected to the numbers. It's specific connected to the subjective experience with any object. Yeah, I agree. Any symbol could have individual associations, which thank you. But, but the argument in principle here is that we could have experience of numbers which was not connected in the way you just described, which, which was more pure mathematical. And the question is, is it then connected to any modality by necessity? And as far as I can see, no. Maybe but through symbols we've been able to, to abstract. Not, first we go to several modalities and then we go to some sort of modality free. Of course there is a carrier here. There's a carrier of the meaning, which is actually either written or auditive. That if you have the word three, there is that word, or a symbol. I mean, there is that symbol, which is in a particular visual or in a particular sensor, sensory modality. But you could say that the connection between that symbol and the content, as we say in linguistics, is arbitrary. There is no strong connection. And so in that sense, we still are, we have done, a, it's, it's more abstract than a picture. Okay. So here, one of the, this is one of the questions that you mentioned, linguistic cultural variation in multimodal communication. What is communicated? How is it communicated? Where and when? So, for example, if we take, it seems to be the case that all human beings can produce tears. We can cry. Most human beings produce tears when they are sad. Some human beings produce tears when they are glad. All their cultures in which they uh, laugh or produce tears when they are glad, to a greater extent, than in the culture, you know, in, yet then using them for, for showing sadness. I don't know. But I do know that crying is more allowed in some cultures than in others. And this has been investigated in many different ways. Let me, one example I just thought of right now is a few years ago there was a survey in all European countries of course, you might distrust surveys, but you know it's one way of trying to get information sometimes. Uh, where the question was, is it okay for men to cry publicly? And it was found that the answers from different European countries varied a lot. Okay, in some countries they didn't think it was very okay at all, and in some countries they thought it was more okay. If I remember correctly, which country do you think it, where it was most okay? Sweden. No. No. Sweden, you would have thought because Sweden, according to Hofstede, is supposed to be so feminine or something like that. But it, no, no, it actually was not okay in Sweden. Not very okay. No, Swedish men are not supposed to cry. Sorry, Swedish women to which country? Italy. Italy! Italy. 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 That, that's the country. <laughs> <laughs> and if you look at the Hofstede scale, Italy is not supposed to be very feminine at all. <laughs> so, you know, you, whatever Hofstede means, I'm, I'm, as you know, I'm somewhat critical of Hofstede, but uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're not supposed to cry in <laughs> 
lạnh lắm hả? Yeah, big mass shooting. Okay, so there are such surveys, and we know that there is there is probably quite a bit of, of cultural variation in the expression of, of these what they mean and how when they're used. Sorry, and I also. Yeah, why don't you do it at the end of the room, and yes. then when you are finished, pass this list to the last person so it can be sent around while I'm talking. Perfect. Good. <coughs> then we have activity variation in multimodal communication. Okay, what does that mean? So, is multimodal communication different when we teach, than when we have a negotiation, than we have a private conversation with somebody, when we are flirting, etc., etc. Depending on what activity we are engaged in, you can all see that we will use there will be differences in multimodal communication. This is again another topic which has not been studied that much. We have done a few studies, but there's a lot of space still to do more studies in this field. Here we have, I think you brought this question up, is it possible to translate between modalities? Uh, and I, again I want to say that we should not mix up then translation between means of representation with translation between modalities. So if we're translating between pictures and words, <coughs> that's not between modalities in the first instance, it's, a, it's between means of representation, it's between symbols and icons. Maybe you've heard this expression that a picture is worth a thousand words, because you can describe any picture in many, many different ways. But maybe you've not heard the opposite, namely, a uh, word is worth a thousand pictures. How can that be possible? Well, think of a word like not, or possible, and try to, write, to draw a picture. It's going to be very hard, <laughs> very, very hard. And so in the same, I mean, you can go both ways here. Pictures and words both have their own specific kinds of, of advantages, disadvantages, and it's not so easy to go between them. But in any case, when you go between pictures and words, you're not primarily going between modalities, but between different modes of representation. Okay, so that's actually a question we have here. Is it possible to translate between types of representation? Up here, when we are talking about translation between modalities, there we have to look at such things as intensity, duration, more basic physical qualities. Loud noise, strong light, long noise, long night light signal, repetitive light signal, repetitive sound signal, things like that probably are possible to translate between modalities. <coughs> okay. We come down here to question number nine. What is synesthesia? Do you know, does anyone know what synesthesia is? Never heard? Okay, there are certain people, you talked about individual associations before. There are certain people, as soon as they hear numbers, they also hear those numbers, they see colors. So if they, or it could be sometimes, they see, if they hear the number nine, they immediately see red. Or if they hear the number five, they immediately see blue. Or they see the number in blue. Or things, things like that. So there are, this means it's compulsory combinations of sensory impulses. When they see one thing, immediately another sense is called up. Does anyone in this room have this kind of experience? You look like you have it. You have it? <laughs> you have it. <laughs> <laughs> you have it. <laughs> people, when they think of numbers, I think they imagine them black. They imagine them black? Yeah, I think most of people do because ah. it's written black all the time. I don't imagine any color myself, no. but maybe you do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anybody see? You you have a sensation? No, no, no. I was just wondering, but isn't this kind of a dysfunction when somebody's like, uh, you know, these composers, etc., when they uh, hear a note and they can taste it or something? Isn't, isn't it kind of a... 
something is wrong in the brain. Why do you want to call it a dysfunction? Uh, well, I mean, it's, you could call it's it not, a special not, function. Not, not, this, not this function, but um, <laughs> something is wrong in, 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 in the brain if it mixes everything up like that. But if you can taste notes. I can taste the letter A. Well, mm, yeah. no, it gives me a taste. Yeah, it is, it, this is exactly the kind of experience we're talking about in synesthesia. A combination of, of, so you taste the note, or you see a color when you see a certain note. You want to call it the dysfunction, you want to say it's something wrong in the brain. Other people say, no, it's not a dysfunction, it's a special function. It's the development of the brain. You can be more positive or more neutral, if you like. Possible. But anyway, that's what we mean by synesthesia. But you had a question. Yeah, isn't it like often when people achieve great mental goals, like memorizing 500 numbers after the number yeah. or anything, that they often when they are getting interviewed and they have to explain how they actually yeah. have to memorize the they stuff. They group the numbers on the different colors. Yeah, that yeah. color they go to a house yeah. and they have a number in every room. Or is, is this kind of... Yeah, that could be part of synesthesia. So I, I would be more, actually I'm, not, I'm more inclined to be positive. I think it's a special I'm not saying that's negative, I'm just saying that it's uh, a bit not normal as what no, we are used to. No, uh, it's not normal. It's out of the norm. Don't we all have some uh, associations with some particular things? It's just that uh, these people have it more. Yeah. Uh, okay. Active You're right. Uh, be. Yeah, because if even uh, there is research, I have a degree in literature, and I know that in poetry, uh, there was lots of research in that every person said actually every sound yeah. associated with a uh, color, uh, with uh, some color, and it's totally natural. For some people, yeah. It, for all people. Mm -hmm. Oh, All people have, no, if you think of it, those people don't think of it. If you think of some color and if you ask uh, some sound and if you ask the person, do you have, uh, what is this created with? They will say something. I want to test your hypothesis now. Everybody listen to me now. And afterwards, I'm going to ask you the question, did you experience some color, OK? And then you tell me which color. <laughs> Any color? Dark blue. Yeah. Me too. Oh, I, I'm just confused. Was, was that the letter or a sound? Actually. <laughs> so you didn't have any. You? Yeah. yeah. No. No color. No color. Anybody had a different color than dark blue? Yeah. Yellow. Yellow. Yeah. Yeah. How many people? Yeah. And how many people had colors at all? And how many people did not? So, you know, it's like 50% of the company. I think, I don't think we can say that everybody has it. Some people have it, some people don't. Yeah. But if you think about the musical you know, like you said, let's see. And we already know that it's discussion, and this could be, you know. Yeah, it could be a bias. Yes. I could have destroyed the experimental conditions. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. Maybe we just any. No, no. Oh, you're right, you're right. You should be more cautious. Yeah. Yep. It was the same thing. Same, okay. No, no, anyway, I, all my purpose right now was to explain what this notion means, right? <laughs> That's synesthesia. And there's a lot we don't know about it yet. It's an exciting, actually, topic to go into. See to what extent people are in or use sensory qualities together. Some, some people cannot stop this, they have to do it, right? Other people can do it more voluntarily or intentionally. Okay. Then we come to a more practical question. How can cognitive development in general, uh, in different tasks, be best supported by multimodal resources? So the two girls there on the back bench were talking together. Yes, you two. You're actually doing something right now, which is an example of number 10. How is that possible? Well, we can divide attention and we listen to you and we listen to you. No, you read number 10. Why are you an example of number 10? Because you're computer. Yes, because you're using the computer. Their cognitive development is supported by a multimodal resource in front of them. 
Okay, so this is the question. How do we put multimodality into various artifacts that support our thinking? And right now, the most uh, common and most discussed example is probably the computer, but there are lots of other examples around us. Can anybody think of any other examples of, of this question? How can we use artifacts that activate different sensory modalities to help us in our cognitive development? Using pencil, and pencil is an old, old example of this. Making a drawing or writing down words, etc. Yeah. Anything else? Recording. Recording. Yeah. So all of these things, which in a sense externalize our thinking, cognition, and make it easier for us to see it from the outside, also make it easier for us to manipulate it, to change it and to also develop it. So that's basically what all of these artifacts are helping us to do. And if they are multimodal, they might be able to do it more efficiently. Might. Because if you make it, uh, let's say, uh, you have a computer there, and you can normally uh, give you information to your eyes. But sometimes it will give you information to your hearing. Is that helpful or not helpful? Would you like more information which was both audio and visual? Or do you think it's disturbing? What happens if the computer suddenly would have a little hand that came out and said, take it easy? <laughs> would, that, would that be better or worse? <laughs> worse. Okay, in the future I'm sure we'll get such machines that they're supposed to help us, and some of us will like them, and some of us will not like them so much. So in the beginning, for example, I didn't use to, when I send emails, I have to write a lot of emails every day. In the beginning, I always used to turn the sound off. But nowadays, I actually like the sound. You know, shush, so that now, and one more piece of work I've done. Shush, another piece of work. So it gives me a kind of internal satisfaction. <laughs> Yeah. So that's that's uh, okay. That's uh, these are all examples of number ten. How we can introduce multimodality in various artifacts that help our cognition. And you could, for example, one of you could study how this has been done and what the effects have been, etc. Okay. <clears throat> now I come to a more theoretical question. How do we formally represent this? Is there anybody here who is interested in mathematics or logic? Usually we don't have that many people of that sort. <laughs> okay, if you were interested in that, that, this is a very difficult question. How should we, for example, have a mathematical representation of the emotions we have in communication? Or even worse, a logical representation? Very hard. I'm one of the foolish people who have actually tried to do this, but uh, I can only report it's fairly difficult. Okay, now that, that is one of the challenges of multimodal communication, to get better mathematical and logical representations of what's going on. This is a problem which is becoming less and less severe. But for a long time, if you studied lang language and communication, there was no talk about gestures. It was all text, 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 text. And linguists, for example, never looked at just, they said, that's not language. They call it extra-linguistic. Nowadays, there are many uh, linguists who say that gestures are part of language. For example, I would say that. Uh, but it, th this has been something which has, I have seen slowly being changed over the past 30 years or so. So that, that tradition of neglect of multimodality is, I would say, a smaller and less powerful tradition than it was only 10 years ago. And that's partly due to the fact that we have much, very much better ways of recording multimodal communication than we used to. Okay, and here, how can the modes of production and perception be made use of, emulated, simulated, in human-machine interaction, human-computer interaction, and how can we make devices that can support human human communication? Have you heard of uh, Google's new glasses? Yeah. And if I put them on and I'm standing and talking to you, do you think it's going to disturb or help my communication with you? Disturb? 
Anybody tried these glasses? So apparently you're supposed to be able to you know, activate the information which was going to help you to talk to this person. Well, maybe it will. That, that's an example of a, a multi-mode device which comes in and, let's say, influences human-human communication. And we're going to see, this is an area which is very rich in possibilities and I predict that in the next 10, 20 years we're going to see many such devices come into the market and you or yourself are going to try a lot of them. Okay, let's see if we... Okay, now this is the last question and I won't give you any time to answer this but I will answer it for you and then we stop. So the question is, let's read the again, how should we study multimodal communication? So, one way is by recording people who communicate with each other in naturalistic settings and creating multimodal corpora. I have been engaged in that quite a bit myself and we have a multimodal corpus that you can make use of if you want to uh, work in this field. Another way is to try to do experimental studies. And, well, we have also done that. There you have, you, you keep some variables under control, you make a, some kind of change in circumstances and you see what the effects are. And that would be more of an experimental study. The third way would be to try to build an artificial communicator, a robot or an artificial agent, and try to simulate various types of well, features that occur in multiple communication. We have not done that so much here, we've done a little of it, but it's, it's a field that uh, is developing fast and there are more and more people trying to work in that way. And then various ways of creating just multimodal applications. Okay, one way to do that, if you want to try to develop a multimodal application and you don't really have the skills to do programming on a computer, is to fool people that you have a multimodal computer application by play acting. That's very often called a Wizard of Oz technique. Do you know the American story about the Wizard of Oz? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so what you have is you, you tell people, sit in front of this computer, and then you interact with the person. But in fact, you have a person behind in another room who's sitting there and sending signals and trying to act like a computer, but more clever than the computer would usually be. And this person who is in the experiment believes that he or she is communicating with a computer when they're in fact communicating with this other person. We have done several such studies in order to see, well, in more in principle, what the effects would be of providing that sort of information on a computer. Very often those studies are, then, I, I would say, applications of some sort of multimodal communication. Okay, that's what I wanted to say today, and you can also think there are probably other ways as well. That's, what, that's all for today. Thank you.